I'm Paul Joseph. Uh, I don't know if I've had many years of experience. Uh, I don't think years actually teach you anything, but thank you. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about today, uh, like what I was saying earlier, at PayPal we have several use cases where we deal with massive amounts of data. Some cases streaming, some cases analytics, some cases a mix of both. So what I'm going to cover today is one use case for site monitoring. So you might think uh, a com mature company like PayPal, uh, being in business, very successful, we would have figured these things out day one. <coughs> but we are the world's biggest startup, right? <laughs> As the world's biggest startup, and if you guys are doing startups, you're in the startup center, things like monitoring come afterwards, right? First it's about making money, right? You want to get a product out there, you want to get it in people's hands, and you want to make some money. So things like, you know, how will this thing actually stay available? How will it scale? How do we manage the system? How do we operate it? Take a little less importance at the onset, right? And if you have success like PayPal, um, well, that comes a little later than normal, right? So when I joined PayPal a couple of years ago, I was told, well, we need to figure out sort of the, how we improve a monitoring capability. And when I looked at it, our monitoring system starting from application to server to the switches, the entire stack was generating about 250 billion events in a day and about 20 terabytes of data. I think Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, but now our application logging is at that level, right? So this has grown to probably about 350 billion by now, right? And it's growing on a daily basis. So how do you make sense out of that bigger stream of data? What do you what do you want to do with it? When you talk about monitoring, that's a pretty big sort of wide open scope, right? What is it that we really want to know? So we said, okay, there's four things we're going to focus on. We're going to try to do real-time analytics. We're going to try to do some basic correlation. And you know, I hope you guys all know what correlation is, right? So if you have an event stream, trying to figure out which events are really related to each other, even though they may be coming from different parts of the system or different levels in the stack. Detection is actually a big part of monitoring, right? How do you actually know something's going wrong? And then, of course, search, right? So monitoring applications generate massive amounts of logs, Trying to actually go through those logs and find the little bit, bit of information that you're actually interested in. So of course the first conclusion everybody jumped to, let's put all this data in a database, right? And then we can write queries on it, <coughs> and then we can figure out what went wrong. <laughs> Easy. And yeah, it's, everybody knows SQL, right? All of our engineers are well trained. I said, well, you know, it doesn't sound right, right? 250 billion events, 20 terabytes a day. Uh, what else is out there? Right? So everybody said, yeah, let's use Hadoop. Great. Okay. But when we actually did sort of a, even a basic analysis and a proof of concept, right? <coughs> I had a budget of $500,000, and to stick this thing in Oracle would cost me $600 million just in hardware. Right? Scalability is a concern. Traditional RDBMSs are scalable vertically, right? And as you scale vertically, the cost of that server goes up and up and up, right? Okay, so Hadoop was supposed to solve that scalability problem, right? So yeah, we can get some commodity servers, spread them across, and that'll work. Well, what we found out was it takes about 30 seconds to start the query. Obviously not gonna work, right? I want real-time analytics, if I find out. So, don't get me wrong, we're not at 30 seconds even now, right? But we're getting there. But with Hadoop, it wouldn't have been possible to get past the 30 seconds. So what, the, what do we do then? So we needed about you know, five, five million messages a second for load optimization, and about 2,000 simultaneous queries on this data. Right? That was sort of the benchmark we were targeting. So we said, OK, let's look at you know, what's intended for sort of real-time analytics and other things. Columnar databases was one of the things that came up, right? So we looked at vector, uh, sorry, vertica, vector wise, and hard cell. So columnar databases, of course, I don't know if you guys are familiar with these, 
But uh, instead of trying to store data in rows, they tend to, you know, in a simplistic explanation, store data in column structures where column, sets of columns actually then make up a table, right? Or a data grid. Data spaces had some appliances which were data. Both these work very well in terms of actually performance and in terms of uh, giving us the sort of capability to do real-time analytics and scale it out as time went. And they were promised as the lowest cost solution for hardware, software, and power. And they're designed specifically for real-time analytics use cases for streaming. A lot of companies are using them for this. They scale linearly. Since they're sort of linearly horizontally splittable, the availability factor would be had an availability requirement of about 99 or four nights, 99.99, right? Uh, they meet that requirement. So the number of nodes you can put in, you'll meet the availability requirement. But again, do we have the money? Right? <laughs> All of these things come at a cost. And I think that's how uh, solutions like uh, you know, Hadoop and any other open source first came about, right? Someone's thought of a way to solve a problem solve it at low cost, solve it efficiently, solve it for all the parameters that are important. So these solutions, although they were suited for what we were trying to do, had a cost associated with it that we couldn't bear. For example, just as cost, so Gigaspace is a sort of data grid, we would need 500 nodes just to set up the data grid. 500 machines. So you can imagine, uh, you know, our whole data center today runs about 2,000 machines. So I would multiply the data center footprint by, you know, 25 percent to just get sort of visibility into the data. So what we ended up with was uh, sort of a uh, custom multi-dimensional aggregation mechanism, which was not invented by us at PayPal, but eBay had this, uh, you know, working for about two years. And as part of our analysis, and this is proprietary, so I can't tell you the details, otherwise I have to lock you in a room forever, right? So, so this, this is what we end up using, end up picking to actually go implement on our site. Uh, there's an ad hoc query system for read-only nested data. Right? This is sort of the biggest problematic query when you're actually talking about real-time analytics. We get meaningful compression out of it by actually aggregating data and not trying to store all of the raw data. And then the time series data, right? So split off uh, different types of data into different data sources. So all of the time series data go, now goes into a round robin data list. So the first thing, um, Hadoop, is it really synonymous with big data from all the sort of you know things that we played with? Well, it does work for simple batch processes, right? That don't have hard real time requirements. It's pretty efficient. Uh, you know, and now things like iterative processing are being added to the loop in the recent releases. In you know, when they go to sort of one data and things like that. But many tasks, things like uh, anything to do with asset requirements, right? Anything that requires asset properties, anything that requires continuous incremental updates, Hadoop is not a good fit there. Uh, and those are the use cases we have. So someone earlier asked a question about the actual transaction process, right? We use OLTP systems for transaction processing. We use Oracle at the scale that we run at, at the size we run at. We still use Oracle because an RDBMS is even now best suited for transactional uh, type of use cases. So the lessons learned out of this, there is no one solution. There is certainly a way to jump to conclusions and try to fit one solution into the problem space you have. But there isn't one solution to everything. You have to pick what fits you best. And that same thing goes for big data, right? That's sort of a general principle I try to follow. I think the same thing fits for the big data. <coughs> so uh, I guess, do we have any questions? I know we have 10 minutes to get to that. I hope I didn't uh, use up anyone else's time. So any, any questions? Uh. My name is Chandu Nayak. You know, uh, there's a lot of things that you've talked about seem to be largely structured data. But a company like PayPal, I'm sure, might be getting a lot of unstructured data as well. How do you kind of handle that? Number one, and number two, how do you integrate it at all with structured data? 
So you're right, a lot of the data that goes into things like logs and other things is unstructured. Right? Uh, but again, if the, our primary use cases for analytics are based on at least semi-structured data. So outside of log files, uh, we don't have, and even uh, for why the sort of centralized application logging is, is in place is to put some structure on the data so that it's not completely unstructured. Right? So the way we have it, 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 it's a constrained set of fields, and yes, there's variance in the values that goes in these fields, but it's not completely unstructured. Uh, we don't have major use cases where we deal with sort of documents. Uh, even our transactions, uh, so once the transaction actually hits PayPal, again, it's constrained by the interfaces we provide. It's sort of structured by what data we actually expect in a particular interface. And same goes for the interchanges with our partners. So most of our data is at least non structure. And we don't try to sort of marry it with structured data, like I said. You know, we try to split it not at the data tier, but more so at the application tier. I have one question. When you said uh, when you said about real time analytics here, uh, what precisely? I mean, if you could tell that, what precisely is yeah. that real time analytics, so, especially with PayPal? So, for example, one of the prime use cases is a decline. So, when someone submits a transaction, that transaction can get declined for a variety of reasons. Right? Your credit card was expired. Uh, we detected that you know this is a fraudulent transaction. It's coming from an IP address in a geographic region which is not the same as the geographic region you normally do a transaction from. Right? And many parts of the system can actually decline the transaction. And external partners can decline the transaction. So decline is a business metric we track very closely. So at real time, we want to know how many declines are happening from which part of the system or from an external entity. Uh, another example, we have cost associated with processing. Uh, in many cases, in some countries that we go to, our transaction volume is uh, sort of fraction of a percentage compared to the volume in the US. So if we have an outage for customers in that country, right, it will not be detected in the overall sort of health of the system. But for that country, for that processor, it's important for us to know if the transactions are going through or not. So to figure out, in a country like France, with a, pro with a particular processor who charges us less than another one, are all the transactions going through as they normally do? That's another case of real time. So it's things. more a uh, quality uh, than a prediction than the... No, it's not transactional, right? So it's, it's, it is analytic. Yes, uh, probably a little bit yes. saying that uh, you just uh, pull the data out of the warehouse every single minute or every single <laughs> you can't pull that much data out of the warehouse and you can't feed it to the warehouse. Uh, yes, but, but yes, so it's, process, it's processing the streaming data, right? That becomes important. So, actually, let me decide. Like, since real time you're giving this data, what are the cost costs that are going to be done? Like, declines, you do. How many are genuine and how many are wrong? So, uh, can I lock you in a room? <laughs> no, no, no. So, even, so there's a percentage of declines that we do that are false positive and that are, that are sort of positive, right? Uh, that is a business metric that is not publicly uh, sort of available, right? Because that's, we don't even expose our risk rules or anything related to those rules, even for test purposes to our external partners. Right? So, if you try to test against our system, you don't ever hit a decline, right? So there is no way to actually, you know, percentages are there, we measure those internally, uh, and they're under 5%. I will not give you the exact percentage, <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's under 5% that, that are um, sort of false positives, and that's all, that's where sort of the metric is tracked for our risk systems to actually track continuously lower but you excellent way to do that because I'm saying that the recent experience is that for me. I mean, two of my genuine transactions decline. And that's what we can tell you, right? So then you start coming up with stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so one suggestion I have is that, you know, um, each speaker, we can 
Can we take a couple of questions? Then, but then we're going to open it up for questions and ask a lot of questions. I mean, it may not be about your, your transactions with PayPal, but probably <laughs> big day or later. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll be glad to help you and uh, sort of tell you why your transaction mm -hmm. likely declined. If you can give me a PayPal account, I need a password. <laughs> <laughs> I need something to start with this. <laughs>